Okay, hi. It is snowing and blowing it out there, so I don't think it's safe for any of us to be really on the road, um, especially for the sake of a review that I can sort of give you um, in this format instead. And I'm just now noticing there's not enough light. So, um, this is what we're going to do. Um, what I was planning to do in class today on campus, which uh, is plentiful not going to happen because I-75 is insane, um, is uh, I was going to go over questions 4, 5, and um, 6 with you on your first midterm for Phil 101. Uh, this relates to Plato's Phaedrus, and um, so I figured I would just break these questions down, give you a bit of review with regard to uh, the Plato material that we are discussing. Um, so the first question reads, uh, Plato in the Phaedrus argues that the right sort of love, well, it's Plato's love, so it's platonic love, can bring us closer to the perfect truth of the forms. All right? So the first thing that you want to do is present an overview of Plato's theory of the forms, his metaphysics, and his theory of recollection, his epistemology. So I figured out what I would do is break this down for you um, and stay on the screen uh, again, uh, just so that you have a bit of a refresher on Plato's metaphysics and his epistemology, the connections between us, the knower, and that perfect truth, the known. Right. So, um, more or less, what Plato is getting at there um, is that these forms or essences or ideas are that which make a thing a thing. And I've given you several examples of this. Um, I kind of like the 3D printer example, right? It's the idea of the thing which begets the thing. Um, if you type into a 3D printer, insert like the essence of the thing, the idea of the thing, the specs of a thing, the schematics of a thing, what you get is a copy of those schematics or those specs. Right? But what Plato's claiming is that this too in nature is the case. Right? It's the idea, the essence, the form of tree that makes a tree a tree, and the particular okay, back on the screen, and the particular tree is just an imperfect copy of this essence. That's the nature of this truth. Like I've got here, the forms are perfect, they're universal, and they're immutable. What a tree is is what a tree is today versus 100 years ago, 1,000 years, 2,500 years, what have you. There is a permanence to this abstract truth. Right? Um, yeah, what Plato uses quite often are mathematical examples. A triangle right, is what it is, and this is frankly not a triangle. It's a representation that's supposed to call to mind the essence of triangularity. Right? So what Plato wants to claim is that this truth exists independently in another realm from this world of appearances. Right? When we look at a particular thing, all we ever actually see right, with our senses, with our bodily faculties, is a series of accidental attributes. Right? Which I had my cat here to show you because he's huge, he's black, he's whiny, he whines for food all the time, right? He's a he, um, etc. I, I would call him mo morbidly obese, right? Even we've got him on a diet, it's improving, that sort of thing. But everything I've just told you about our cat Hugo right, is accidental, right? He could still be a cat, and all of those things, the black, the obese, the whining for food, what have you, could be false and he can still be a cat, right? So for Plato, when we actually intuit a thing, it's these essences, these forms that are what make that thing what it is. But this leads to sort of a problem, right? This is the connection between Plato's metaphysics and his epistemology. When we encounter these objects with our bodily senses, if all we get all the time that we are 
the combination of body and soul, which um, Plato mentions, uh, is uh, the nature of a living thing. So is insofar as we're alive and experiencing all experience, this embodied experience gives us are these accidental attributes. We never come across the perfection of the forms in experience with our senses while we're embedded in the world as this composite of body and soul. It's only the mind or the soul that is able to intuit these forms, just like with the triangle here. Triangularity is an abstract notion. Right? All we ever see is my sort of crappy representation of a triangle here. Right? So, right, for Plato, nothing in experience is sufficient to beget a knowledge of these forms. So where do we get it? This is the epistemological dilemma that he is um, framing for us. Well, we are this composite being of body and soul, and while the body um, comes with senses, desires, and is mortal, it's basically our meat suit that we walk around in, our soul is, according to Plato, immortal. Um, he gave us uh, that very, very strange argument for immortality, um, uh, the, basically an argument from motion on um, page, give me a second, um, uh, 29 to 30. And like I say, I'm not asking you questions about that argument. It's a weird argument. He's got better arguments for that. In fact, the argument from recollection is a little bit more compelling. Right? Since we actually do have access to and utilize these forms or essences on a regular basis, we recognize chairs as chairs, tables as tables, uh, trees as trees, cats as cats, dogs as dogs, even though these particular things given to you by your senses right, are always particular and not sufficiently alike to actually warrant a unifying concept, right, we do make use of these forms on a regular basis. Where did we come to an, a, a foggy knowledge of these forms? Well, Plato claims from before. Right? These ideas are innate in the Mino, um, which is part of your Five Dialogues book. He actually uh, encounters um, a slave boy with no knowledge of mathematics, and through a series of prompting questions, he prompts this slave boy with no knowledge or training in mathematics to, through the exercise of uh, this reasoning part of the soul, solve a fairly complicated mathematical problem. So, it's like ragu, it's in there, right? Already, we are born with some sort of foggy intuition of these forms. So, for Plato's argument to stand, we must know these from before. We have these ideas innately in us. The problem is that the body and the senses and desires and our mortality and the, the, our embeddedness in this realm of appearances is, well, it's very distracting. It's very distracting. So, right, basically what Plato claims that our position is, if we want a knowledge of this truth, we have to pay heed to and cultivate uh, this it, ability to think, to exercise reason in our soul, and recall through this theory of recollection that which we know from before. So for Plato, a couple of interesting features. Right? First off, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. All learning is recollection. Right? All genuine learning is learning about these forms, and the only way that we have any access to them whatsoever is because we had an intuition of these forms before our soul joined our body. So the task for the human being is to recall what we already know. Right? The other feature of this is that these things are not really what they are. Your chair is not a chair. 
your table's not a table, my cat's not a cat. It's just a copy or an imitation of these perfect forms. So the philosopher's task is to exercise our distinctive reason through this process of, of recollection, inferring from the particular to the universal. Right? That's the philosopher's task. That's how we come to a better knowledge of the forms. Now, the next part of this question um, asks you um, to uh, discuss how this argument presents love as a beneficial sort of madness. That is, what is special about love in the context of Plato's metaphysics and epistemology? Right? So, uh, the question is, what, okay, fine, this is the metaphysics, this is the epistemology, this is our situation as embodied beings, we have this soul with the pie chart and all of that. Right? What does any of this have to do with love? Well, in the Phaedrus, um, on page 38 to 39, and these are the relevant passages, so I'll just quote them for you, right? rather than give the answer to the question away. Right? Um, this is the story before we were embodied, when we were soul only, existing in this realm of the forms, intuiting and giving us this knowledge, which we then rec uh, recall. Uh, he claims, uh, right below 250b on page 38, Justice and self-control do not shine uh, shine out through their images down here. And neither do uh, the other objects of the soul's admiration. The senses are so murky that only a few people are able to make out with difficulty the original of <clears throat> the original of the likenesses they encounter here. But beauty, and you see there's something special about beauty. Uh, was radiant uh, to see at the time when our souls, along with the glorious chorus, da -da 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 -da, saw that blessed and spectacular vision and were ushered into the mystery that we may rightly call the most blessed of all. Over the page, um, do -do 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 -do, um, towards the bottom, that was the ultimate vision, and we saw uh, it in pure light because we were pure ourselves, not buried in this thing we are carrying around now, which we call a body, locked in it like an oyster in a shell. Well, that was for, uh, uh, that all, uh, well, all that was for love of memory. That made me stretch out my speech um, in longing for the past. Now, beauty, as I said, was radiant among the other objects. And now that we have come down here to the realm of the appearances, uh, we grasp it spark uh, sparkling through the clearest of our senses. Vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily se uh, senses, although it does not see wisdom. It would awaken a terrible, terribly powerful love if an image of wisdom came through to uh, came through our sight as clearly as beauty does. And the same goes for other objects of inspired love. But now. Beauty alone has the privilege to be the most cl uh, clearly visible and most loved. Of course, a man who is uh, initiated long ago or has become defiled is not uh, to be moved abruptly from uh, here uh, to a vision of beauty itself when he sees what we call beauty here. So instead, gazing at the latter reverently, he surrenders to pleasure and sets out in the manner of a four-footed beast Eager to make babies and wallowing in vice, he goes up after a natural pleasure, too, without a trace of fear or shame. See, what I've given you is sort of the key passage there. Right? So if our task is to go from particular to universal, exercising our distinctive re uh, rationality through this process of recollection, and the senses generally don't help us out with this project, it's all inferring from particular crappy triangles to the essence, the notion of triangularity, or inferring from particular activities of particular people in particular situations uh, to the notion of justice, because think about it, we don't actually see justice, we just see particular people choosing and doing particular things, and then intellectually through the use of our reason, Plato would say through recollection, we would judge or recall the perfect notion of justice 
and apply it to this particular situation. Right. Well, beauty is special. It's one of the forms, it's one of the big forms. Um, the good, the true, and the beautiful are the three big ones that um, Plato isolates in this dialogue. Right. And the good, justice, piety, virtue, and the like, we don't actually see. The true, mathematical truth, triangularity, the essence of a particular thing, treeness as opposed to this particular tree, right? we don't actually see. It's a purely intellectual exercise to get us back up there. But our senses, as he's just told us on page 38 and 39 of your text, right, actually bloody well intuit beauty in this world. So there's sort of a natural marriage of body and soul in the apprehension of beauty. Right? But that last se uh, section that I read, where you know somebody who's become defiled or did not get a good view of um, beauty in that other realm, right, misinterprets the beauty and the love that it awakens in him, this is why we get so messed up about beauty, misinterprets that as an object of physical bodily desire. Right? So rather than gratifying the soul, we gratify the meat suit, right? uh, this, this, this oyster shell that we're wrapped up in. Right? In the Phaedo, he calls the body the prison of the soul. This is something Nietzsche is going to become critical of later. But, nonetheless, right, beauty then shows itself to be the most powerful recollection tool that we have. We can infer from a, a particular beautiful body, a particular beauty um, in, of a sunset, Right? or the beauty that emerges from a just political system, or what have you, we can infer from that beauty of this particular thing that we can actually sense back to beauty as it really is. And when we recall one of the forms, they're all kind of one. All of them come flooding back to memory. Right? So that's one of the things that um, it justifies love, right? Because we've discussed on page 18 of your text, uh, he defines eros, right? Love, as the unreasoning desire that overpowers a person's considered impulse to do right and is driven to take pleasure in what? Beauty. Right? It's force reinforced by beautiful bodies takes its name from the word for force, which is called eros. So, eros, this concept that was so heavily criticized in the first two speeches, the one by Lysias and Socrates' the first speech, becomes that part of the soul, right? It relates to that desirous part of the soul. It's that soul, part of the soul's desire for beauty as it really is. So, how is love a beneficial sort of madness? Well, we get all messed up. This part of desirous, unruly part of our soul gets so messed up when it sees a beautiful body in this world because it prompts sort of a foggy, misinterpreted recollection of the essence of beauty. So, the remaining task for Plato is to basically tell us how to manage this apprehension of beauty in itself. Now, what I'm going to do is pause and um, get a new set of notes on the board for the second of your Plato questions.